Alrighty, guys, welcome back to another episode of the show. Thanks always for being here. We, we love having you here. And as always, as you know, we're with Paulie. Paulie, how are you today, sir? Ahoy, sir. Ahoy, Captain. Ahoy, Captain. Uh, doing, uh, captain, my captain. Uh, <laughs> I am uh, doing really, really well. It's lovely to have some semi-manageable uh, weather in Melbourne, which is lovely. Yes. Um, and yeah, had a, had a great morning thus far. How about you, mate? Yeah, had a great morning. I've, uh, I've had my coffee um, and I think it's always a good morning when you have your coffee. <laughs> coffee is God. Yeah, coffee is God. That's true. I think that's, that's a that's a very famous expression, that one. Coffee it's is God. It's got to be a t-shirt, surely. It's got to be a t-shirt, that's right. <laughs> well, guys, we are, we are very, very privileged um, to have a guest on the show. Very excited. This has been um, in the pipeline for a long time and um, – we're going to change things up a little bit today. We're going to introduce um, the guest with, with the bio first so that you guys have some really great context um, as to um, not only why we're interviewing this person, but also um, the, the some of the stuff they've done, which is um, pretty, pretty exceptional. So, Chris, first of all, mate, thank you so much for jumping on the show. Thank you. It's a privilege. And uh, I hope I don't uh, make you feel weird by reading your own bio to you. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Be good for the listeners. So, guys, Christopher Kerr is the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Executive Officer at Hospice and Palliative Care Buffalo. Born and raised in Toronto, Canada, Chris earned his MD as well as a PhD in neurobiology. His background in research has evolved from bench science towards the human experience of illness as witnessed from the bedside, specifically patients' dreams and visions at the end of life. So you can get a bit of an idea as to why I'm so pumped about this one. Um, Although medically ignored, these near universal experiences often provide comfort and meaning, as well as insight into the life led and the death anticipated. To date, the research team at Hospice Buffalo has published multiple studies on this topic and documented over 1,500 end-of-life events, many of which are videotaped. This work was the subject of his TED Buffalo talk, which has been viewed 5 million times. I'm sure it's probably a lot more than that now. It has been the subject of reports on the BBC, in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, the Scientific American, Huffington Post, and Psychology Today. And it's also featured in a recent docuseries on Netflix called Surviving Death, which is where I came across your work because I was watching that show um, with my partner, Chris, and a PBS World Channel documentary called Death is But a Dream. Dr. Kerr's work has also been published in a book, Death is But a Dream, but a dream by Penguin Random House in multiple languages. Chris, we are so pumped to have you on the show today, mate. What First first question, can you tell us why you got into palliative care? Because I think for a lot of people, end of life is it's a touchy subject. And I would say that most of the Western world is actually quite death and dying phobic. So what actually drew you into that world? Um, I was the gold medal death phobic person. Right. Uh, I was extremely uncomfortable with it, um, which makes medical school a good place to be because you never really <laughs> talk, talk about the reality of it. Um, certainly not the experience of dying. Uh, I wish I could tell you it was something aspirational, um, uh, but it, it, it really, what it was, I was actually, I enjoyed the acute side of medicine, the interventional side of medicine. I was an ER doctor and a cardiology fellow, and I needed to support my family. And so I was looking for moonlighting opportunities on the weekends that I was off. And there was an ad in the paper for a hospice doctor. Mm. So I showed up in 1999 really not knowing um, what to do or what I was about to do. And um, I, just something remarkable happened um, in a time when people go into clinical work like this and often their best impulses are squeezed out of them because of the demands and the assembly line of it all. Mm. Um, I was really found this the most rewarding role I'd ever played. I was given time to be present at the bedside and um, was just reacquainted with our commitment to, you know, treat where possible, but to comfort always. And um, I just found it was the most meaningful work I'd ever done. Um, so I went back to my department chair and said, I'm thinking of doing this. And at cardiology in this country is one of the most lucrative things you can do. 
And he asked me perhaps that maybe I should see a psychiatrist. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Truth, truthfully. And oh, he actually, okay, right. Oh, yeah, because at that time, palliative medicine was in its infancy. Mm. It didn't really exist. It wasn't a subspecialty yet. So it was something that you regarded maybe if you retired and you wanted to volunteer. Mm. Um, but the need was compelling. Um, the fact that we got to care for people in totality with regard to their family um, and all the complexity of needs from practical to existential to physical, it just, um, and that you were given the time to do it. Um, I just, and I've never looked back. Yeah. I, I just, I've got to ask you something. The first question that comes to mind for me um, when you were talking about your role in palliative care, it's quite a paradox from my perspective when it comes to the medical system and the emphasis, emphasis that they place on treating a patient versus um, connecting with a patient bedside manner versus delivery of medicine, diagnosis, et cetera. And I, I have a few friends in the medical field and from what I understand, what they teach in terms of communication, connection, empathy, uh, being able to truly connect on a human level with somebody is, let's just say, secondary to the uh, to the administration of um, of you know medication, etc. Et um, it seems like it's a real uh, focal point and a spotlight in your field. Yeah, it's actually the antithesis of what's happened in medicine. So. Uh, there, there's an interesting survey that has come out and for the first time since the survey has been done and it's been done for a long time most physicians don't want their children to go into medicine mm -hmm. and um the exodus from medicine early or into other areas is 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 massive wow. as is dissatisfaction and my kind of theory on it is, is a little simple but i think people come to this with every good, again, instinct and impulse to be a, a, a certain person in their role as a physician. And a lot of that gets squashed. Um, th this is hard work. And if you aren't rewarded at a human level, not just a monetary level, if you're not rewarded at a human, you be, it, 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 it's, it's an empty and draining job. Mm -hmm. If you um, are fed, in the richest ways, um, it becomes a vocation, a calling, and um, it, 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 it's, pri it's a privilege. Mm. Um, so I'm fortunate to be protected in our role here that allows us to really harken back to a different time. You know, in medicine now mm. is all based on organ systems. So we tend to be a bunch of spot welders. You see a kidney guy for this, a lung guy for this. Yep. But you don't get to take care of the person in totality. And, um, and, there, and really, in this country particularly, it's the economic model has squeezed our interactions with patients to the lowest common denominator to get an outcome. A targeted assessment, a targeted intervention, and off you go. Um, and when it comes to dying, when you're deemed you're no longer curable, um, you literally, uh, it's a form of abandonment. There is no reason, there's no code to go into the hospital because you don't feel well and are dying. Mm. If you need an image, an intervention, you're going to get world-class, multi-million dollar care. Um, but as a human, when you're suffering, it's not so easy. And that's where hospice comes into play in this country. Now you're going home and when you need care and support the most, you're probably least likely to see us see it unless we're there. Yes, it's it's amazing, isn't it? And I think, you know, something that you laid, laid out really well in the beginning of your book, um, which is actually something that I'd never really thought about is that, you know, um, and it seems plainfully obvious now that I'm kind of talking about it, but the, the entire field of medicine is there to stave off death, you know, to stave off um, the end of life. But at what point do you think that staving off death and trying to keep us alive actually becomes this kind of, you know, um, pretending like it, it doesn't exist to the point where, you know, we, 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 
we feel like not so much to the point we we it doesn't exist, but to the point point where we feel like we fail if the patient does die, even though dying is probably possibly the only thing that we know is going to happen. You, you, you've actually framed it well. Yeah, I mean, we we view death as medical failure rather than the closing of a life. Right? Mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. it's a it's a medical paradigm that's not working. Um, we are as a culture terribly death denying. We've lost our way with dying. It used to be an accepted, even in I, my lifetime, you were allowed to die of old age. Uh, now you, you, you got, when you die, you've got to have at least six diagnoses. Mm. Uh, so we're, and medicine's death defying. And there's this sense that we can always do something. And so we end up in this odd paradox where most people when asked want to die at home and don't want treatment futility in the face of futility, yet a third of them are in ICUs and ERs and everything like that, which ironically doesn't lengthen life in the end. Yeah. You know, so it's uh, it's an expensive proposition. It is not aligned to patients' wishes. But part of the problem is there's such an accuracy around prognostication that a lot of people don't have are making uninformed decisions because there's this sense we can always do something. You know, we're very consumer driven. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if somebody gets a diagnosis, it's understandable. You look up Google and you go chasing stuff. And here it's, um, it, you know, we have a, a health industrial complex. Uh, analogous to the military industrial complex. So we have people who sell hope um, for probably diseases that can't be cured. Mm. So you've got a patient population that is disconnected from the reality and a medical culture that's happy to play along equally obtuse to reality. Um, So we don't do it gracefully anymore. It's completely different. Mm. It does make you think. <laughs> it really does make you think. I mean, it's just, I mean, f- from my perspective, you know, you see, you know, Paulie and I are obviously very um, um, big on social media. We're promoting the show. We, you know, we do businesses and stuff on social media. Social media in a nutshell, you know, is it, it really exacerbates this stuff as well. You know, even down to, you see, you see apps that defy aging. You know how to how to make yourself look younger. You know, and get rid of the wrinkles and all these in all this thing. And I think so. I'm I'm 29. I turned 30 um, in four months. And for me, because I'm in that world still, it, it's it, I'm probably not as aware as how death defined death phobic we are the only reason that i am is because i happen to be really interested in existential psychotherapy you know death and dying and the meaning of life um if it wasn't for that though um i'd see it was normal but i can't imagine what it's like you know being my grandma seeing you know being 90 91 92 just a, an amazing life of incredible experiences seeing some of the technological advancements the people she's met you know the places she's been and having a whole society that says we don't want anything to do with that so long as we can look young because being young for for whatever reason is the pinnacle of what we all must be yeah i mean we're we're horribly ageist right yeah and there and there's a cl- clear sexist component look at our brilliant actresses that can't find roles once they age out right right absolutely i saw a picture of simon crowell i believe his name is you know from yeah. whatever and what he had just done to his face. Yeah. Um, and it, I thought to myself, my Lord, you know, the lengths people will go to to sell themselves as, as almost a product. Yeah. It's just, you know, it runs, it flies in the face of one's reality. Mm. Um, it creates a false pretense that you can defy this process of aging. And um, yeah, it, and then of course, when it comes to illness, uh, I had a 87 year old gentleman uh, last week who had lost, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 pounds, and he had pancreatic cancer. Mm. I mean, th- that's a terminal diagnosis. And he really had no awareness uh, because he had started on this assembly line, right? So there's imaging involved, blood tests involved. Then next thing you know, you're going to get scoped up. You're going to get scoped from below. Um, there's another uh, assess. There's a consult to, key, to medical oncology, radiation oncology. But 
nobody in all that processing had actually sat the guy down and said, you know what, treatment is going to actually probably hasten the process and uh, diminish your quality of life Mm. more than likely. And this is a terminal diagnosis at this age. Um, You know, and and the funny thing was at that age, people usually do this pretty gracefully and he was accepting. Yeah. The fact that he had been, had all these touches and, you know, it's his life. Mm. And in an age of autonomy and information ownership, the fact that he didn't, he, he would be have have all this medical exposure and not be aware of his own mortality. Mm. So it just it happens all the time. And we we do live in these small like these microcosms of worlds. I would imagine, like you know, using Simon Cowell as a as an example, I would imagine that. If you live in a world like uh, I don't know Hollywood or LA, when you look around, uh, you, you don't see that this is something that um, strange or that peculiar, because you know a lot of people around you are doing the same. Right. Thing. So oh, yeah. your environment really breeds yeah. normality, so to speak, um, which which fails to give you a reasonable amount of perspective. Yeah. Anyway, you know, it's it, it, what's what's sad in that, and this is, I guess, a more a larger social cultural issue, is that we um, we're, we're we're missing out on the beauty that comes with having lived a long life. Yeah, like, like we we never see the portrayal of old love. Mm. Uh, I, I'd know, love it doesn't oh. happen. Uh, and, and I'd love to talk to you or ask you some questions about any cultures that you've, um, you know, investigated or explored that really do cherish and honour, uh, you know, the, the people that do age. Um, I know, for example, um, uh, you know, when 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 women go through menopause here in the Western world, it's a um, seen as you know something to to really be looked down upon, um, to be shameful of, so to speak, to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. But in Japan, menopause translates to second spring, and there's wow. a real celebration right. associated with aging and wisdom. And there are cultures in the world that have these um, real celebrations of the elders. Yeah. Mm. And, and and are less modernized cultures definitely care for their elderly different Mm. they're revered um and they're cherished and there's lineage and and that's their tie to their past all of those things and respect is inherent yeah we've lost obviously uh we're more disconnected than connected now unfortunately yeah well, Chris, why don't we um, why don't we get into a um, some of your research then? And um, you know, I'd I'd like to again um, just bring it back to the book for, for everyone. By the way, death is but a dream. It was such a fantastic read. I, one of the things that I think you did so well was just give the reader an unbelievable amount of context. I, I mean, I can't I can't remember how many anecdotes of different clients that you, you had in that book, at least 20, surely, you know? Yeah. yeah. Just so wonderful to, to listen to all of these experiences all the time. And you had, you actually have um, a lot of these interviews uh, videotaped and recorded. And, you know, you, I was lucky enough to have those sent through when you, when you sent them through to me, but the, the beautiful thing that I, I loved from reading it was, um, and 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 Irvin Yulong talks a lot about this this kind of stuff as well. I really love Irvin's Irvin's work. Um, but just how at the very end of it, really what we all really want when it's stripped back is 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 the same. It's the people that we love to be around us. And and there's this beautiful kind of tying off if we're given the chance to accept our death, the tying off of our lives. You know, to reflect and go, wow, that was a really wonderful. Uh, challenging at times yet meaningful ride and if we're constantly in this space of pretending like it doesn't exist or even worse as you said being told that you know, we don't have cancer when we do um we're, we're not given that chance to really go wow that was really wonderful but but let, let's let's introduce you, you, your research so so you've just started in palliative care and and one of your patients i said i think i might have said clients before that's my world one of your patients sorry chris um was talking about dreams and visions and then you had a conversation with a nurse but do you want to elaborate on that 
Yeah, I, his name was Tom. It was during the tragedy of uh, HIV and AIDS-related death. And um, he was young, and I always found that difficult. And I went in and saw him, and he was talking about seeing his mother. And I went into the nurse's station, and, it's, and it's, you know, I think desperate to have a role, said, let's do this, this, and this, antibiotics, IVs, get more time. And the nurse, without even looking up, said, no, he's he's dying. I said, well, how do you know? And she said, because he's seen his mom. His disease mm -hmm. And what became very apparent is my colleagues in, in spiritual care, social work, and nursing you accepted this, and they still do. I mean, if you talk to nurses, they just go, yes. Um, it's preaching to the choir. And they also could use it prognostically because they viewed these events as increasing as people near the end of life. And in frequency, intensity, and in content, they started seeing the deceased, which we were actually, ironically, were able to show later in one of our studies that got so much attention, is we interviewed people every day before death. And it's really important that your listeners understand that these are patients who are lucid, we rule out confusion, they have to be screened, this is university approved, there's witnesses, and they were filmed. Yeah. So these are people who are fully intact, acutely aware, and talking like we are. And um, that's what we found. As they got closer to death, they uh, nearly 90% at least reported one experience. Um, we use the term dreams, but they're the people are adamant that they they don't normally dream or these were different. They're not um, metaphorically garbled and all that. They're very clear and they're based on real events. And as you said, they tend to um, reflect on the best parts of living mm. uh, where our greatest and lasting accomplishments are our relationships. And that's what seems to matter most. And when we looked at whatever dream content people were dreaming of and asked them to grade the comfort of that. Um, the greatest comfort was in seeing the deceased. So the life itself is validated. Those people are still palpable, familiar, and present for them. And in doing so, it almost lessens this, the impending death. It doesn't deny death. It almost transcends it in mm. a very odd way. And there seems to be this editing process where the people who didn't love us correctly or didn't secure us or condition their love are excluded. And the people who truly held us dear um, are prominent. So it may be one parent, not another, uh, one sibling, but not the other two. Uh, and it's just this idea of being put back together in the sense of being whole in the end. Mm. It is, it, I mean, I'll give you a bit of an anecdote here. So we, we lost um, a very precious little animal to us um, coming up on three months now. And I've since had four dreams about little Steve. Steve was a, our, our dog. He was actually a palliative uh, dog. He had congestive oh, heart yeah. failure, I believe. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, he had this crazy cough, but it wasn't ever that bad. And then it got really bad towards the end. But we, we didn't know. <laughs> There's actually a photo of him right here. This is with my partner. Um, oh, Siobhan, that's, huge. that's Steve there on the other side of her, there you go. <laughs> that was a really lovely dog. And we didn't know how, um, important he was to us until he passed because he just left such a hole in, in the family fabric. You know, he was just war, his energy. I mean, as you know, Paulie and I spoke about this actually when it was, that was actually quite, um, healing for me, mate, speak, speaking about that. Um, but yeah, when he passed, um, obviously you're, you're going through a lot of pain. Um, and then over the course of three months, my dreams have changed and I'm, I'm a very, I could tell you everything about my dreams. It's always been that way for me. Um, but my dreams have changed in the beginning. It was this kind of sensation, like I couldn't reach him, you know, and I've written them all down because I'm a little bit weird, <laughs> but, but the second dream was he was being held by another family. The third dream um, he was playing. And then last night, believe it or not, was, was the fourth dream. Um, he was looking at me and he was with me. And, and it seems to be that there's this really kind of lovely emotional processing going on um, with, with my dreams. But the, the coming back to your work here, Chris, the part that's really, so, cause we know, we know dreams can have that, that 
function to, to emotionally process. And I think they stages one and two, they can kind of loosely correlate to physiological restoration and rejuvenation in stages three and four emotional um, rejuvenation and processing. But what's really interesting about some of your research and what I certainly learned from reading your book was that what you said just before, there's, there's not so much this kind of greater perspective, wholeness, take the good with the bad, you know, good parent and bad parent, much more of moreover this kind of meaning making, how can I see the positive side of all of the difficult things that was that 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 I went through did you did you was that surprising to you yeah I I I thought that you know because everybody knows about near-death experiences where people are you know almost structurally changed given messes issues addressed sent Mm. back to prophetize whatever that's not like this at all this Mm. is this is not about great epiphanies uh meanings revealed uh, religious pronouncements. This is simply about the best parts of having been loved and mm. loving. So there's often very little said between the dreamer and the people in the dream. So it could just be like you'll, you'll hear almost everybody in the videos just saying they were just there and I just knew. It's knowing, it's feeling, and it doesn't require really a lot of language. And people don't come out of it with questions you know the time for therapy is over they're done um they just le- they're just kind of left with this sense of they're okay and that they're loved and that they're not alone mm. Mm. god's amazing isn't it <laughs> really yeah amazing. you know i mean it's, it's 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 so common and and what was interesting you know this idea that we fight the dying process the dimming of the light and all that kind of stuff we actually use measures of post-traumatic growth as people were going through this process. And this there's this really cool paradox, right? They're physically dying, yet psychologically and spiritually, they're alive, they're gaining understanding. And the take home is there's important living to do while dying. And just because you're dying does not mean you stop living. I mean, it's a vantage point that's unique. It's not surprising that it's introspective and reflective. And, you know, when you're first diagnosed with a bad disease, you're f- worried about the practical issues of it could be finances or what have you. You gradually let go of those things. Mm, and yep. you're, you're what you know, you're reduced to your 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 better self, really. Mm. And you just you think about the things that matter. It, it, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, you, you, I suppose you think about. Um, people that have a tendency to harbour resentment towards po- those that have, quote, unquote, done them wrong or, or wrong to do them. It, it, it really, it's, it's irrational to harbour any resentment if um, that there's no further kind of journey to be able to swallow that poison pill. Right, right. right. Well, where is it taking you, right? Mm. Yeah. It doesn't serve any practical... Um, or, or emotional value. It's not to say that these are all pleasant. So in about I don't know, 17%, they patients rated them as discomforting. Mm-hmm. But what was fascinating, so so it, it, it reflects the life you led, right? So if, if your life is notable for suffering from PTSD from war, dying doesn't deny that reality. The difference is, that some of the most transformational experiences were the negative ones. Mm. So that you may have saw the gentleman Dwayne, you know, who had yeah. been in jail for most of his life and um, hadn't really acknowledged any regrettable elements, and he was terrorized, um, thinking he was being harmed by all the people he had harmed. But he woke up and he asked to see his daughter, and he expressed his love and his sorrow. And he slept peacefully thereafter, which is important because it's hard to die if you can't sleep. We've had a lot of a lot of veterans with decades long survivor's guilt, medication, group therapy, nothing helped them. And in the end, they were unburdened. So I, again, I, you know, we had a mother whose kids were in jail for drug related offenses. Her whole identity as a mother was in question. And then in her moments, she's greeted by her parents who tell her she's a good mom and a good person. 
a lover. So whatever, we're all wounded for having lived. Um, none of us get out of here clean. And um, these experiences don't deny that um, and, and tend to address what those wounds are. And often, mm. often the biggest wound we have is loss. And um, that's what often gets returned. Mm. It's interesting you mentioned about your dog. Because 30 or 40% of people had an experience with their pet. Yeah. And you've often wondered about this. And uh, again, I think that the, the overarching theme is, is love. And, and it, pets are something we love purely and unconditionally. And that's returned. So it's kind of mm. not surprising they reemerge. It, it makes those, I think it made a lot of sense when I read about now, I can't remember her name, um, but she was the 14 year old. And I think her dog's name was Shadow from the book. Yeah. 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 Jessica. Jessica. That's exactly right. Because she, she hadn't, I suppose, been old enough to really lose um, people close to her. I mean, obviously you can when you're 14, but the thing that was, close to her was was her dog shadow and then seeing her dog again you know just just ties that part off that that loss that pain you know um and i think one one thing that i really found interesting from from reading death is but a dream was the the, the parallels drawn between what these dreams and visions offer us um uh quite similar to what some of the psychedelic research is saying you know, yeah. psych psychedelics have this wonderful ability to dance with our own psyches, our own minds, you know, and we're all very interested in some of the, um, you know, the, the, the greater visions. Oh, I saw, you know, machine elves and I went to another world and all that. But but the healing aspect of, of psychedelics is really just doing a lot of what these 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 dreams uh, and visions are doing, you know, and, and especially, I, I mean, I'm really excited about that that research for people who are particularly resistant to uh, opening up Pandora's box, shall we say, you know, and, but what I think is really cool about um, the human psyche is that when we are faced with the ultimate reality, you know, being the end of our reality, it, it, it's going to happen anyway. You know, we are at, at one point in our lives going to have to face um some of our pains to make meaning and, and, and grow whole from that. And I don't mean that, um, you know, instead of like, Oh, you know, we better be brave and show up. It, it doesn't have to be like that from, from the sounds of things, especially from reading your, your book. Yeah. No, every time I read about that research, which I think is wonderful, it, it, it the, the, there's something that's happening endogenously or, or organically. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it, it becomes kind of undeniable. Um, when, when you see it, you know, with such regularity, the instant rate being so high and the, the there's so many common themes. Um, it, yeah. But yeah, very, very similar. It's accessing things, too, that we might not otherwise consciously access. You know, for, uh, when Ginny saw the dog, um, I mean, came to her. And, and by the way, she's on video, and um, so, so is uh, so not only Jessica but Ginny, and both of them. They, they used the same language. They said, "When asked about the significance of the, the dead animals returning, it means I'm not alone, and that I'm loved." Mm, mm. Same, same thing again. Same you message, know. Yeah. yeah. So, what about the visions then, Chris? Uh, was it? I imagine when you started, um, you know, putting this stuff out there you know, just with natural skepticism and so forth, people could probably um, connect on the dream side of things because we've all had certain, you know, weird dreams, um, you know, um, from time to time. But when you're talking about visions and people being very lucid, was that a bit of a stretch for skeptics or? Yeah, it's a stretch for me. Uh, yeah. It's uh, so what, here's exactly what happened. In our questionnaires, we asked them if they were uh, awake or asleep. And 50% of the time they said they were awake. Mm. What's really weird about it is that when you walk into the room, it's not like they're usually seeing the person. You're not seeing them visioning. Their impression is that they're having visions. And, and one of the theories is that they're maybe they're lucid dreaming. Mm -hmm. So the sense of being more awake than they are. So one of the things that happened in dying is sleep architecture is destroyed, right? You, you, you progressively, it's fragmented often. 
but you're mm -hmm. generally sleep. The, the tendency in dying, just like you do less physically, you do less wakefully as well, mm -hmm. and you sleep more. That, you know, very few acute deaths are acute, and it follows a pretty predictable trajectory of sleeping more. Mm -hmm. So whether, um, you know, the nomenclature we're using is just wholly inadequate. Visions aren't really describing visions and patients go out of their way to tell us these weren't dreams. Mm. And we, we actually asked them in one search study to measure the realism on a zero to 10, 10 being the most real. And the most common number is 10. Wow. And they're just adamant. This isn't like other dreams. And they're really, they're just, they're qualitatively very, very different. So we call them end of life experiences. I'm yes. not sure what they are. Uh, I, and you know, we've long stopped trying to interpret, um, yeah. and we're really just relaying what our patients are telling. And that's why filming them was so very, very important yeah. because um, so many assumptions are made. Otherwise, these people are confused, they're fe fail or free will, feeble minded, they're drugged, whatever, um, and they're just not. Has yeah. there been any imagery or scans associated with their brains w when uh, these types of uh, visions or dreams uh, take? No, there there would be no point. Because, yeah, right. uh, I, I mean, I, I have a background in neurobiology. You're not going to find an organic basis for this, just like you won't. Somebody can't show you love. Um, yeah. It's really the mind, not the brain. And I, I, I think it's irrelevant. And the, you, you have to understand some of these patients were living on their own, yeah. driving their car. I mean, we went months before death. And Oops. if you watch the videos, the thing that's most striking is, wow, they're, they're fully intact, aware. Um, and, and in some ways, um, they have heightened acuity. Mm. Uh, because they're intensely affected by these and processing these and relaying these. And that was actually the one fun thing about doing the book and the films was that nobody said no. Everybody wanted to participate. Amazing. And it's kind of really a good, it's kind of a very nice, speaks well of us because there was no okay. secondary gain, right? Yep. They're not looking their best and they're often sharing the real stuff of having lived, the hard stuff, the muddy stuff but they wanted to be heard and they wanted to contribute so it's kind of cool mm. i do have to admit it was hard for me as someone who does does love um jungian analysis <laughs> not not to read through about some of the dreams and go, oh, i wonder what that the meaning is there and the symbolism there but I, I think you're exactly right i think that the point is that um yeah we we we, we want to understand things logically scientifically rationally um, but it, it certainly does sound like we don't have the right nomenclature for what's going no. on here. The, the other thing is we really have to be respectful of patients. I, I've been doing this 23 plus years. I've never had a patient wake up and say, hey, doctor, what do you think this means? Mm. So for example, you in health and bereaving your dog went right to the process and right. changes of each dream. I've never had a patient say that yeah these are not there's not a lot of dialogue um and people in the videos say that repeatedly it's felt it's intuitive it's understood mm. and they don't need to interpret and i think mm. that's kind there's kindness in that and n nobody's ever said what do you think this means isn't that amazing and yeah that, and that way they're very undreamlike so yeah. there's no there's no puzzle nothing to unpack yeah. there's no weird metaphors they know what it means. If, if you lost your parent as a child, and at the end of your life, that parent is present. Um, yeah. There's really nothing. What more needs to be said? And in that way, they're so qualitatively different than near end of, uh, near death experiences. Yeah. Which are so altering to people. Yeah. Uh, you know, throughout all of this research, what do you feel the main takeaways you've kind of gathered and uh, gleaned that you could apply? To your life, for example, that's such a good question. The one I usually avoid. So, <laughs> so one of the things we really did, it's risky um, studying the dying process because we're all immediately drawn to interpreting what it means. It's this keyhole death and you can look through it and you can see afterlife, religion, paranormal. 
So we tried to stay on this side of the door, not interpret, and really went worked really. We wanted this validated and accepted clinically to have, be relevant. So we didn't we didn't editorialize and interpret. That said, to answer your the question, I I want to avoid, you know, because I'm not particularly, I, I'm pretty primal when it comes to these things. I'm more comfortable in a sterile position of not having to process what it means. But I honestly, I think that where I end up is that after seeing this all the time, um, is there's a better story um, that it's not empty. And um, we've done studies of 750 bereaved family members who were at the bedside when these were crying. And that's how they were left, people who saw the patient come. Mm. Um, that, you know, if you were parents together um, and you were a life partner for six decades and you lost a child, and at the end uh, of your partner's life, instead of being empty or screaming or vacant, um, she's holding the baby and referring to it by name. That, that affirms, not denies life. Um, and that takes death from something that's um, physically dec decline and destructive to something that actually gives us hope for having been alive. Yeah. And the other, the other takeaway for me is the fact that so many people return to us. You know, we see it all the time. Somebody in their ninth decade of life who lost somebody when they were a kid and that person, the mother comes to them, is present for them, hear the voice, smell the perfume. It gives it gives credibility to this notion that they're never really gone because they're accessible. Yeah, that's so true. And, and, and that to me is mm. it's fascinating. And by the way, the way they recall the clarity, so they not uh, often it's an animal. They may not remember if in, in another state that much detail about their childhood dog, but at the end of the life, when the dog's on the bed, they can tell you all sorts of things. Mm. So. I, you know, our memories, our emotional histories are triggered. Like if you listen to a song from when you were in high school, right? Absolutely. Bang, it puts you back to a different yeah. place, and recontextualizes you. These experiences seem to do that to people. Mm. So it, 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 it re-embraces them to something from their past that mattered to them deeply. Um, and I, so I think that... I don't, I don't think time doesn't seem to be so relevant, right? Because again, their childhood is there for them. I think the people they love the most um, are there for them. Um, and I, I also think that um, fear, if you watch the videos, the one really profound thing is they're not talking about the end of their life in fearful terms. Mm. You know, they've sickness is hard. They've worked through um the fight and there's a different level and their concern for others not themselves is what yeah. comes to the surface so it, it, again it's this idea of a better version right um than one would imagine chris if i could um piggyback off paul's um question there has has your research changed how you view your own passing so i actually have cancer and, right and um, um, I'm doing well and probably will do well. And I was diagnosed, you know, uh, over a year ago and, mm -hmm. um, it, it, no, I'm as fearful as hell as the next person and not of the process of dying, but because death, um, for most of us is not about us. It's about leaving those particularly who are dependent on us. Mm. So if you have a young child, once you've worked through the issues around your own mortality, your concern is of and for them. So um, our innate and ferocious resistance towards dying is real. And that is why people in their ninth decade die very differently than people in their third decade of life, mm. um, because they have an incomplete story. And they're too interdependent. You'll often hear people who are age say, I've lost everybody. 
or they don't need me anymore. They're okay. So it allows them to let go. I, I, the best analogy is that if you're a parent and their kids are teenagers and they're out on a Friday night and um, you're supposed to be home at 10 and you're tired and you want to go to bed, it's very hard to close your eyes and let go until you hear the door click. Mm. So people think of being able to die, you have to be physically comfortable, right? That's actually the least problematic issue. You have to be psychogenically, existentially at peace. And that is a very hard thing to do mm. if you're a parent of children mm. and you you have an unfinished life. Um, so, yeah, no. So the answer to the question is I'm, I'm not fearful of the process, um, the actual process of dying. Um, I'm just ferociously against the idea because I got people who I love and need me. Well, you've also got about 48 um, subsequent podcasts on the Body Meets Mind show to, to, to work through, mate. We have to have you on here again and again and again. So, <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Absolutely correct. <laughs> well, Chris, I mean, we're, we're aware of the time and, we, you know, I'm going to get, get you out of here at some point, but I mean, it's uh, it's it's amazing stuff, and and I, I think one of the best things, you know, just to kind of revalidate, um, you know, what what you really tried to do before. One of the things that I think you did really well in the book, and in the docu series as well, was, you know, steer clear from the paranormal side of things. And I and I and I'm not saying as, as you know, in a sense that all the the the, the paranormal stuff is is bad, but I think it would it would fly in the face of validating the actual patients and it would get us to start thinking about, oh, what happens after death? Oh, my God, isn't this amazing? You know, and again, we would just completely bypass the experience of these people that are having these these visions and these dreams. So, you know, I think, you know, that was one of the, the, the things that I love the most about your book and, again, hearing you today is that time and time again, you're, you're bringing it back to the patients, you're not talking about what this means for us, even though someone like myself is really interested in that. You're bringing it back to the patients, and I think that's probably one of the big reasons as to why your research has um, um, been distributed in the way it has, because you did have done such a wonderful job of of highlighting their experiences. Well, th th thank you. I, I think we there's so much goo around dying and death that um, we take an objective. We're so much of it's defined by what we see. And yet we seldom talk about what the actual dying person is actually experiencing. Mm. That's all we wanted to do was capture the patient's subjective inner experience at the end of one's life. And I don't, you know, dreams, visions, whatever, it's, it, it's integral to the dying process and it's profoundly therapeutic. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, Chris, well, thank, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your research your personal uh, anecdotes and uh, yeah, your, your heart with um, everyone that's been able to listen to this. So from the bottom thank of you. our hearts, thank you. Great. Thank you both. It's been a pleasure. Beautiful, mate. We'd we'll, we'll love to have you on again. Chris, very quickly, is, is there any something you're working towards at the moment? What's obviously you're going through cancer treatment at the moment. We understand that, but what's, uh, what's on the horizon? We're, we're so our, our first studies, you, you see, we've done seven. Our next studies are really um, looking at what do these experiences mean to the patient in terms of how they view their dying process or their life. So we've captured the occurrence. It's happened. It's this frequent. It means this. But what's the end effect? We've, we've captured what it means to bereave people. Um, what does it do? Does it make them feel more grateful? Um, all of those mm. things. So higher level stuff yes. um, from the patient's perspective from a processing standpoint. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, ho hopefully when that um, gets published, we'll, we'll um, get you back on the show if yeah, you'd be so kind. So. Yeah, yeah. Thank that you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. And uh, we'll right, you guys. Have a good day.